All right. So we're going live again on uh, Facebook. So try to keep it down to a minimum roar in here for part three of Covenant Relationship. Now for the last two weeks, or the last two Shabbats, we've been kind of hammering the men kind of hard. And basically saying, everything your wife does negatively is your fault. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to. Uh, because there is, like the old military saying, do we have a failure to communicate? So evidently we're not communicating the way we should be communicating. We're not, we're not leading the way we should lead. Uh, I, I did a shirt for Fifth Sabbath, just iron on, it's not... Not a, not anything special. I just made one for myself because I I found this picture that I love. It's, the, it's my it's my mind's image of what true leadership is, and it's it's a two part picture. And the first part it's a boss. It says boss up there, and it's got this guy sitting on this huge stone with a desk in front of him and a chair, and he's pointing at men like this who's got a rope that is pulling this stone with him on top of it. And then the picture below it says leader. And now the stone is empty and the guy who was the boss is now in, out in front of these three men with the rope helping drag the stone. That's the difference between a boss and a leader. Are we, gonna, are we going to control and dominate our family or are we going to lead our family? So leading them by example if you're truly leading by example, then your wife and children are just going to fall in line behind you. But sometimes we as men do not know how to instruct our wives. Okay? So this is where all the women turn off the camera this week and build up their hatred for James Gillespie. <laughs> because we're going to talk about women a little bit today, okay? Here we go. So... Uh, but I, I, the reason I'm talking about women is to help you men understand what the picture of a, of a wife should look like. Okay, And so if you have to lead them, then you should be leading them, not controlling them, helping them to become the picture that maybe we're going to present here in a minute. Okay, So to begin, sexual immorality. What? Talking about women and we're automatically we're jumping right into sexual immorality. Okay. Deuteronomy 22, 22 through 24. If a man found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gates of the city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. Why did he say that in the city? He's being specific there. Because there's another part that if he finds her in the field where nobody's around and nobody can hear her scream, then she's absolved. Okay. In the city, she should have been screaming and yelling and somebody would have come, and supposedly, and tried to help or tried to rescue her. And she's still absolved because she's screaming. She's in the city, right? But if they just find her laying together in the city, she's just laying with him, right? Okay. Okay. So that if a virgin be betrothed unto a husband and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both to the gate of that city. And ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he had humbled his neighbor's wife. Now they're just betrothed. Why did it say his wife? Because it's his from a trifle. We're gonna we're gonna look at that here in just a minute. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. So because we're so Americanized, we're so Greek. We have such a Greek mentality, we don't understand the way a picture of marriage looks nowadays. Okay? So, we have to understand the culture of, of what a marriage looks like in this day and time. So, a girl who has entered the stage of nida, or, um, I don't know, I'm 
I'm not too delicate, so let's not just put it down. <laughs> when she starts having her monthly cycle, okay, Nida is just a pretty Hebrew word for that, okay. So when a girl enters in Nida, she becomes of age to be betrothed at that point. So, meaning that she can now bear children. So she can become somebody's wife at that point. And as far as the custom is in this day and time. Not this day and time. The day and time that we're talking about. So, a young man who would, would have probably been somewhere around 18 to 20 years old would notice the young girl. Notice, you know, that she started to develop into a young woman. And he would go tell his dad, Hey, Dad, I really like old Hootendoo over across the way. <laughs> so, could you go talk to her dad for me? Mr. Hootendoo. The dad would probably tell the son, Okay, uh, now you've worked with me for the last, you know, 10 years, learning how to be an apprentice, being a carpenter or a stonemason or, or whatever that family's job was. And, and for your service for helping me the last 10 years, I'm going to give you part of your inheritance so you can so you can, can be betrothed to this woman if her dad accepts that. So you come with me and we'll go and talk to her dad. So both the boy and the father of the boy would go approach the damsel's mother and father. And they would enter into an agreement. Okay, uh, This is the betrothal process. Now the father could say, okay, I want... Two mules for Sister Sarah. <laughs> so, this year of betrothal was for two reasons. One, so the groom could secure the dowry for the daughter. Okay? Two, so he could prove that the damsel had not played the harlot in her father's house. Okay? So if she became pregnant and gave birth to a child in that year, then she had played the heart of her father. Right? So there had to be a whole year spread between her coming into Nida and her actually becoming a bride. Okay? So at least one year. Now, after that year, at some point, they would say, okay, on the 27th of... Nissan, we are we are going to have this way. But the week before that, ten days before that, they would take the bride with the bridesmaids and they would secret them away somewhere in the in the village or the town while she prepared to become this man's bride. So as she was preparing, the groomsmen would have would find out where she had been secreted away. You know, word of mouth. And during the week, they would be going by there at nighttime, going at, at dusk, almost every night. Hey, Sally Ann. Hey, Sally Ann. <laughs> if she stuck her head out the door, she was unworthy to become that guy's bride. So the, so the bridesmaids would stick their head out and say, you go away. They were her protectors at that point. Okay? But then, on the night of the wedding, whatever night that the groom chose that to be, he would have already went and prepared the hoopah. He called for the rabbi. He said, Dad, tonight's the night. So mom and daddy would be there waiting at the hoopah. And he would go to where the bride had been secreted away, and he would holler for her. Sell in! Or hootin' doodle, whatever your name is. <laughs> Come out of there. So and she would hear the voice of her groom. When she heard the voice of her groom, she would come out the doors. And he would take her by the hand and he would lead her all the way down, probably through town, the village, where all of the people in the village could see that he's now taking his bride. And they would all come out of their houses and they would begin to join the wedding party. And just file in behind them until they made it to where he had prepared the hoopah. And the mother and the father and the rabbi would be waiting for him to take his bride. He would stop before he got to the hoopah. 
his bride would then, because now there's light, this would be a lighted area, he would have been calling for her at sundown, so he wouldn't have been able to inspect her, but now he brought her into the light, and she would walk around him seven times, and he would inspect her to make sure that she was exactly the person that he had chose to be, because we got tricked one time, didn't we? Yeah. Well, that's where that came from, huh? <laughs> Just talking about laying Rachel there. Yeah. We got tricked one time. So this one's coming in the line. <laughs> so you, you inspect her. She'd walk around you seven times, and he would take her by the hand, and they would step under the hoopah, and the rabbi would say the blessings. And then there would be a tent or a bedroom in her father's house already prepared. Not in his father's house, but in her father's house already prepared. The wedding ceremony, the bride and the groom is not even there for most of it because they now go into the bridal chamber and they consummate the marriage while everybody else is out here getting drunk and partying and having a good time. So are they. <laughs> Better speech. Just away from that party having their own party. They come out. They bring the sheets that, that they have consummated their marriage on. They fold them up and they present them to her mom and dad. And her mom and dad take the sheets, they fold them up, they put them somewhere in the house because at, at any point after that, he decides, oh, I don't like her. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm mad at her tonight. She burnt my toes. So I'm going to claim she wasn't a virgin when I took her. So now, the mom and dad come out and say, hey, you don't talk bad about my daughter. Because now you're not only you're bringing a shame on her, you're bringing a shame on me, saying that I wasn't a good father that protected my daughter, or that she played the harlot in my house and I tried to cover up for her. So here's the tokens of her virginity. You lay them out before the city, and then the elders of the city now take that groom who's falsely accused his bride, rough him up pretty good, make him give his, his uh, father-in-law... <coughs> We'll just say a thousand pieces of silver. A year's wages for bringing a reproach upon his name. Or trying to bring a reproach upon his name. But then, there's another little line under that. Scripture says, from that day forth, he can never put her away for anything. He can't put her away for anything after that. <laughs> But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. I know nowadays they teach us men that women are as strong as men. Come on. Might have been roided up. <laughs> I took them. But you, you double up your fist and hit your husband, and let him double up his fist and hit you. We'll see if we're the same. We are not the same. We're very different. That's why the scripture is saying she had no fault. She's not expected to fight you off, <coughs> let you kill her, trying to get what you want. Okay? So let's read that again. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then a man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when the man raiseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and lay hold on her, now, now we have to look at this differently. This one is not betrothed. She's not a husband, she's not a wife, she's not betrothed. She, she's just a virgin of Israel. Okay? If a man find a damsel that is a virgin that is not betrothed and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver. That's a lot of money. Okay, let me explain to you fifty shekels of silver. So, 
Anybody know what your tithe to the temple was supposed to be every year? A holy half shekel, right? Okay, so a holy half shekel. So this is literally, if you give 50 shekels of silver, that is a hundred years worth of tithes to the temple. That's how expensive this, this virgin is that you took. Okay? Does that put that in perspective for you? Okay. A hundred shekels of silver. And she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. I don't know why I added that scripture. We're not focusing on that right now. We'll talk about that in another, another section. But we need to understand. The father takes this very seriously. Now, if somebody comes and rapes my daughter, do you think I'm going to want to give her to that guy who raped her? What's the Torah tell me to do, though? Because you have to. So I have to, right? That's rough. You men that have daughters, think about that for a second. <coughs> <laughs> That's rough. That's super rough. There's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. Tell your wife to go kill him? No, you there's, another to place, <laughs> there's another place in the Torah that it looks like it gives us an out. He can, pray, he can pay the price of a virgin. The father doesn't give the daughter to him, but now the, the daughter can no longer be married to anybody in Israel. She has to remain in her father's house. Okay? So why did the father I didn't put that scripture in here. But it's there, I see. But it's there, okay? It looks like there's an out. But I'm, I'm just saying, if you do that to my daughter, synagogue, you better get ready to raise some bell money. Because <laughs> I'm going to prison. <laughs> just, there ain't no ass and or buts about it. I mean, I, I, I would hope that I would be strong enough. To, I mean, even if it's just accepting the price of the bride and allowing her to remain in my house, you have defiled my daughter. Now we look at us men <coughs> to God because we are His bride. We're the ones that He created for His pleasure. Okay? So if we look at that in that same sense and we think about our emotions when we're thinking about somebody defiling our daughter, what does the father think about when sin defiles us? Mm. Now do you understand why he's wrathful? Why he's angry? Mm -hmm. mm. It's a very serious, serious thing. One man, seven lives. Here we go. Let's talk about food. It's not what we're it's not what we're talking about at all. So let's not even go down that road. <clears throat> Isaiah four one. And in that day seven women shall take a hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now, when you read the scripture, somebody wants to turn there real quick. When you read the scripture in, in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1, this is like a standalone verse. This verse has nothing to do with what's being said for the rest of that chapter. So it leaves the reader to think, why, why is this just an inserted thought into this passage? It probably shouldn't have been an inserted thought. So somebody go back to chapter 3 for me. And read the last three verses of chapter 3. And then read verse 1 with that included. Okay? The last three. The last three of chapter 3 and the first verse of chapter 4. And so it shall be. 
Instead of a sweet smell, there will be a stitch. Instead of a sash or rope. Instead of a well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty, your men shall fall by the sword. Okay, what's that? Your men shall fall by the sword. And your mighty in the war. And your mighty will fall in war. Her gates shall lament and mourn. The people in the gates will be lamenting and mourning the loss of your men. Go ahead. And she being desolate shall sit on the ground. And the women being desolate will have to sit on the ground. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man. And in that day, what day? In the day that all their men are killed. Now that makes sense, right? It's not the standalone thing anymore. It should have been part of that. In the day that all your men are killed, because why were they killed? If you read the verses before that, it's because they were rebellious. They weren't listening to Yahweh. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. They weren't covering the women of the land. They weren't doing their job because they didn't want to take responsibility for the women. That was the whole thing. So the father destroyed the men away from them because the men had advocated their role. The same thing we've been talking about for the last two weeks. Men advocating their role to their women. Letting the women rule over them. Letting the women take care of everything. And the father was so sick of seeing that, he allowed them all to be killed. And now, at the end of that, the women are saying to the men that are left, just to the ones that are left, Hey, I don't need your money. I don't need you to build me a house. I don't need you to, to come and do that big hoopla and march me down the streets of the city. All I, I, don't need you, I don't need you to buy me clothes. Yeah, you don't need a box of candy. You don't need any flowers. Just let me be called by your name. Let me step under your covering, is what she's saying. I don't need you to give me kids. I don't need to have sex with you. I don't need any of that stuff. All I need from you is for me to have a covering over me because I don't have any children. I don't have any male heirs to give me that covering. That's what this verse is saying. Because in the last days, women are going to realize how important it is to Yahweh for a woman to have a male covering over them. Like we said on week one of teaching this covenant teaching, women were not made for Yahweh. They were made from man for man. Men were made for Yahweh. Okay. Numbers chapter 30. This is just going to show women or men are different. I know our society teaches us something different, but the Word of God teaches us something totally different than what our society says. So if we read Ch Numbers chapter 30, her father can nullify any vow. Does that seem like she's equal to her father? Her husband can nullify any vow. Does that seem like she's equal to her husband? <clears throat> Her father can choose to give her to the rapist or to have him stoned. Is she equal to her father? Because if he says, hey, you got to go with your rapist, guess what? She's got to go with the rapist, right? He can't put her away for the rest of his days. Locked into that. A husband can bring his wife to the temple if he suspects her of cheating. We talked about that a week or so ago. If he just suspects her of cheating, he can bring her to the temple, the priest will take the, sweep some dust from the floor, he'll put it in some holy water, he'll make her vow a vow. If she drinks it and, she, and she's played the whore in her husband's house, her thigh will rot out, her belly will swell and her thigh will rot out. Okay? Meaning she won't be able to bear children. So when we, when we begin to understand men and women as the Father is looking at them, are different. So, if we can start from that perspective. Isaiah 31. Woe to the rebellious children, saith Yahweh, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. <laughs> Everybody hear that? He's talking to men here first. Okay? Woe unto you rebellious children who are taking another covering on top of you. I'm supposed to be the only one covering you. Okay? That's what he's saying. <laughs> and now you're, you're making your sin worse because you're putting another thing 
over me. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 3. Be ye followers of me, even as I am a follower of Mashiach. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Mashiach, and the head of every man, or of every woman, is the man, and the head of Mashiach is Elohim. Okay. Now does that sound like it's talking about a hat? Does that, does that in any way sound like it's talking about a hat? No. It doesn't, does it? Because it's not talking about a hat. Now, every time somebody teaches this message, it's about covering your head. Okay? Read the first part of the chapter. It's clearly not talking about your head. This is talking about spiritual covering. Who covers us as men? Yahweh. Yahweh. If we pray with our heads uncovered, meaning praying outside His will, then we're ashamed, right? If we cover our heads, remember what He said right there? You've covered your heads with some other covering. Adding sin to sin, right? So if we cover our heads, hiding ourselves from Yahweh in our sin, we've brought shame to Him, right? That's what this scripture is about. It's not talking about a hat on your head. 1 Corinthians 11, 5 through 9. But every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Who did he just say was her head? Her husband. So if you pray or prophesy outside your husband's will, you're dishonoring him. Now does that are you equal to him? No. Because you're, you can dishonor him just by praying or prophesying that he didn't give you the okay to do. By you doing that, 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 that right there, you're dishonoring him. <laughs> okay, let's not start throwing stones near this morning. <laughs> Alright. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Okay. Why is it? We just said it wasn't talking about a head covering, right? So why is it now talking about being bald? That doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense if you don't know the Torah. Because the Torah says if we, if we go into battle and we kill all the men of that city and I find a female that I want to make my wife, what do I have to do to her? I have to bring her into my house, shave her head, give her plenty enough time to mourn the loss of her father or whoever was her covering at that time until her hair grows back and then I can take her as my bride, right? Now you understand what he's talking about? So he's talking about essentially her being unclean? Exactly. She can't be a bride. She can't be clean at that time. Because she's not. she doesn't have a covering. So is it talking about being shaven or, and her head, hair being cut off? Kind of. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about her being, being <laughs> in a place that she can come under the covering of a man. Does that make more sense now? So a man can marry a woman where her head's already in shape. Mm -hmm. She's got to have how long a life? I don't know. <laughs> okay. When we read the story of Judah and Tamar, Tamar, the custom of that day, if a woman covered her face, like you see Muslim women do right now, that meant they're a prostitute. Tamar covered her face and hid herself and sat by the, the road openly. And then Judah saw her and thought she was a prostitute and went in, and went in and had sex with her. We all know the story. So, of course, she shows Tamar, fight the harlot. No, she, 
But she kind of did. She did play the, the harlot. But at the same time, Judah did not fulfill his, his word to her. His word to her was when his youngest <coughs> son became old enough, he would give him as well to marry Tamar. Because the other two, well, one was just an evil guy and Yahweh smoked him. The second guy was selfish and didn't want to raise seed up to his brother. So Yahweh hated him because of what he had done, spilling his seed upon the ground, smoked him, and then was going to allow the third child to be Tamar's husband. But Judah was afraid of losing his third child, so he didn't want to give that child to Tamar as well, being afraid that he would get killed as well. Anyways, the father blessed Tamar out of that whole deal, even though she had played the heart. The father blessed her, and she had twins. We all know the story, you know, one's arm came out, put a red ribbon on it. It's not our story today, but read it. It's a good story. Uh, where was that? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is in the image and the glory of God. Who's our covering? Yahweh. Should we cover him up? Should we hide him? Because mm -mm. we're if, if we're doing what he told us to do, we're supposed to be in his image, exemplifying him. Right? Letting, letting the light so we don't cover him. He's our head. So we don't cover him. He covers us, right? Okay. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of Elohim, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Okay, so all you women that's been hating on me for the last three weeks when I said you were created for man, hate on Scripture, because Scripture just clearly said it right there, the same way I said it. Lay line. Do what scripture says. Lay line upon line, line upon line. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Yes, it all has to fit. 1434 through 36. Let your women. Now here's where it gets a little touch. Uh oh. Let your women keep silent in the assemblies, for it is not permitted to them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Where does that say that in the law? It doesn't, that's what it does. It says it says it in the law. Where does it say that a woman has to be in obedience in the law? There you go. Numbers 30. That's what that whole thing is about. Being subject to her husband. Being under obedience to whatever his rule is. Even so much that if she was raped, the father could give her to a rapist. That's true obedience, right? Okay. But they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the assembly. What? Came the word of Elohim out from you, or came it only unto you? We didn't bring forth it. Men did not bring forth the word of Elohim, right? right. He spoke the word to us. Okay? The same way if we're leading our families in righteousness, we should be finding an altar of prayer, especially when there's major decisions coming up for our family, that we go before the Father first and say, okay, well, what do I need to do in this situation? What direction are you wanting me to take our family in? Because He's our head. If we listen to Him, I guarantee you we'll guide our families in the right direction. I don't know if I still have that now. I try to. I, I still try to. But there are times that I'm just strong-headed soldier James and I'm marching to my own drum. The father goes, hey, you idiot. <laughs> Back over here. Straight off a little bit too far. We have to realize that it's his will, not our will. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. Okay. 
Now, I know this, women don't like to hear this. It makes them mad because we don't live in that society. We don't live in this culture. But it's the word. So we have to be, we have to take it into account. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. What's a holy hand? Meaning you're submitted to Yahweh, right? It's not your will. That's what I surrender. That's what lifting holy hands means, right? You surrender. If Ryan points a, a weapon at me and I go like this, what's that mean? I give up, right? So that's what this is talking about. You're surrendered to Yahweh. Okay? So I would that men everywhere pray, surrender, lifting holy hands, without wrath or doubting. In like manner also, okay, in like manner also women. How do you be holy? Okay, that's what he's saying. I want you to be, uh, women, I want you to be holy also. Okay? So in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Okay? What's modest? Modest in today's standards versus modest in that day's standards? We're probably two worlds apart. Okay? Now if a woman's just covered, if she's, if she's just covered, she's modest in today's standard, right? Because half the time they women wearing midriff shirts and cut down to here and barely barely covering their breasts and barely covering their backsides and, and some men would even say that that was modest because now you got the booty shorts and you, I mean you see them everywhere I mean it's crazy so what is modesty what does that mean to be dressed in modest apparel does that mean you need to go around looking like a nun Yoga pants. You think your wife is? You think your husband is attracted by you going around looking like a nun <laughs> when he's got fifty other flip tail girls out here parading it in front of him? You think you're really turning him on, dressing in a black robe? <laughs> no makeup on your face. I'm, seriously, let's get real about it for a minute. If that's what you're looking like. And you're wondering why your husband's eyes are straying and his eyes shouldn't be straying. I'm not giving him a go-ahead, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm not giving him the go-ahead. He, he's wrong if he's doing that, okay? But if you're wondering why his eyes are straying, maybe you have something to do with that as well. I'm not saying you need to go out looking like a hoochie mom, okay? Who <laughs> then? That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying take a little pride in your parents. <clears throat> You did be, when you met him, didn't you? If he was going to come over and pick you up for a date, you probably spent two hours in the bathroom combing your hair and brushing your teeth and putting on deodorant and then you spilt lipstick on yourself and had to take another shower and do the whole thing again because you wanted to be prepared when he got there, right? You wanted to look your best when he got there. But then you get married and next thing you know, you're sitting around and holy <laughs> <laughs> Lord hell knows what I'm talking about. We've had this conversation. <laughs> you're sitting around old, old uh, nasty things with holes in them, looking like some bum on the side of the road, and you expect your husband to be attracted to you. Are you kidding me, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you, guy. Guy, that really happens to some men. <laughs> I'm not going to say it this way. <laughs> also, a woman adorned themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Does that mean you can't wear gold or pearls or, or expensive clothes? Is that what that's saying? You're not supposed to do your hair either. Huh? You're not supposed to do your yeah, hair you either. can't do your hair. You can't, can't go get your hair did. <laughs> Okay. That's not what that's saying, okay? It's saying if that's your focus, is your focus on your husband? Is your focus on pleasing God? Now if you're doing all those things to attract your husband, to to woo your husband, is that not a godly thing to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what the Father is doing to us. He's wooing us as men. You should be wooing your husband. I mean, 
you think about the story of, of Leah and Rachel, I mean, they got this battle going on about who is to sleep with Jacob that night. And she sends some of her kids up there, hey, go tell your dad that I'll give you 20 of my mandrakes if, if he'll come into my tent tonight. I mean, they're bartering. She's doing everything she can possibly do to entice Jacob into her tent that night. It's true. But now that we live in a society that teaches monogamy, I'm not, I am not advocating, I did not say that to, as an advocation for polygamy. <laughs> but stay away from that. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we live in a society that women think when they get a man, they got him. And you should. You should be secure in your relationship. But does that mean that you need to quit trying? Does that need, mean you need to... I mean, you look like... Some of these women in the Messianic movement look like they've been coming out of the 1880s. I, I don't know what you're trying to do. You, 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 you're trying to look like a nun and then wonder why your marriage is falling apart. I, I just don't understand those, those concepts. Because although sex is... When, those of us who have been married for a while understand sex is about this much of your marriage. It's the other things that are really important. I'm not saying that, that, that that's not important, but it's the other stuff that's really important. Okay? But you need that part too. Because men, for lack of brain cells maybe, <laughs> we are very visual people. Okay? We're very textile people. We like to see and we like to touch. That's, that's how affection is shown from a woman to us. Now, a woman's version of that is different. They need to hear. They need to be made to feel emotion. Okay? So, hearing and, and emotion on their side. So, Next week when we start maybe talking about sex in a more detailed way, we might explore that a little bit. But we need to understand what the Scripture is talking about. He's not telling a woman that she can't dress up for her husband. He's saying, don't be doing it for everybody else. Don't, don't, be, don't be dressing up when you come to synagogue and show everybody else how fancy you are. You should be doing that at home for your husband when nobody else is around because your husband, what he sees, is he sees you looking like a bum six, seven days a week, and then on Shabbat you come and you're all dressed up for everybody else. He's not worth you dressing up? Jeez. That's, that's the image you're painting in his mind, whether you realize it or not. He's not worth you putting on a little makeup? That's the image you're putting in his mind. He's never going to say that, because... He still wants to touch and feel. <laughs> Realize that might be taken away from him. <laughs> so, <laughs> we may know what we're talking about. <laughs> and men, you're not, you're not exempt from that either. You start getting a big old beer gut on you and coming home, getting in your nastiest sweats, it's got paint all over them and lounging around, burping and farting and picking your ears, and you think, my, my wife should just desire me. <laughs> <laughs> should he? <laughs> no. We all have to meet the standard. Okay? We shouldn't, when we come into a relationship with each other, that should cause us to work harder, to dress up more, to, to woo each other more, to explore new things, that we haven't done before. Okay? You know, I've never had some cuisine. She'll bring me something I've never eaten before and I'll, I'll try anything. As long as it's kosher, I'll, I'll try it. I might not like it, but I'll try it because I have a pretty delicate palate. But uh, the other day she brought me some Asian food that she, how do you say it? Halong, halong? Yeah, halong, halong. She brought me a plate of that. And, for Asian food, it wasn't bad. So I ate a little bit of it last night. 
But I'll, I'll try anything like that because I know she's doing that to try to please me. So, men, we need to take much notice of that. The same way Yahweh takes notice of, even if we're getting it wrong, even if we're getting it wrong, He still takes notice of that that we're trying. Okay? Your husband is still going to take notice of that that you're trying. <coughs> Wives, you need to start make, taking notice of your husband when they are trying. Okay? Because that's what it's really about. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, that, does that mean you can't ever say a word? In church. No. <laughs> no. She, if your husband says, doesn't that mean this? And your wife pops up and goes, no, it don't mean that. What's she done to her husband right there? She's usurped. she's usurped him. She's, she's demasculated him in front of all the other men in the assembly, right? Embarrassed everything else. Okay, so, you, so that's the purpose of them saying, hey, at the assembly, just just be quiet. Don't try to over-talk your, your husband. Don't. That's not saying you can't have a voice. That's not saying you can't ask a question. That's not saying that. But if your husband says something, whether you agree or disagree, you should not pipe up. Okay? Even if you're in disagreement, you can talk to him about that on the way home and go, hey, you know, I realize you said this in synagogue today, but here's the scripture that shows you that you're wrong. So the next time he comes to synagogue, you you know, hey, what? Last week I said something and I, then he is afforded the opportunity to correct that himself in the eyes of everybody, not having his wife correct him in front of everybody. Does that make sense? Okay. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. What? What does that mean? If they continue in the faith and charity and holiness and with sobriety. So a woman who doesn't have a husband, can she still be saved? How? Huh? She's a virgin. She's a virgin. She belongs to Yahweh. She's in her father's house. Her father was covering and he died. And she's, a, she's a, now an a orphan virgin. And the father absolutely is her covering. Okay? So yeah. But how else? Huh? So you're married, you're past the age of childbearing, and your husband dies, how are you saved then? You just continue in the faith. Your oldest son then steps in, becomes your covering. Okay? You still have the male covering because now your oldest son becomes your covering. Okay. Saved in childbearing, as long as you continue in the faith with sobriety. So that's, huh? So you mean Caleb will be my covering? Yes. Actually, Caleb, he's your son. Yeah, but, but he's, he's your stepson. Big be Kyan would be your covering. Oh, okay, but it was Kyan. He was. He would. He he is the patriarch of the of this family when I'm gone. Okay, so he he'd actually even be Kyan's covering until Kyan's old. But when he's older, Kyan would actually be your covering because he's of your ones. Makes sense? He's actually his mom's covering. Right now. Okay. Everybody understand that? Okay. So a woman who is not married and does not have or a son divorced. or divorced, so who is her covering? Son or if she doesn't have a son and she's not married. Well, her father's dead. And her father's dead. So that's the one of the seven women who's trying to go to trying the to other. Or doesn't it go to the next brother? male relative? Like what if you don't have a brother? The, well, what about Ruth? What if you don't have an uncle? Well, you don't have a cousin. Like me, I don't have. So yeah. Well, let's say that I don't even like to say this. But let's say both of my sons die, and I only have male grandchildren. Does your grandchildren go to them? Yeah. 
The oldest, the oldest living male heir would be your heir. That's why, or the closest kin. If you, if the Ruth and Boaz story, you know, uh, Ruth sees Boaz, she goes and talks to Naomi. Uh, Naomi says, do this, and she goes and does that. And then she talks to Boaz. Boaz says, hey, I'm willing to do what you're, what you're asking me, but I'm not your closest kin. This other guy is your closest kin. So let me go speak to him tomorrow. If he doesn't want to fulfill his duty to you, the same the same story of Judah and Tamar. Okay, the brothers were supposed to raise up seed to each other, so the closest kin would come in to you and be your be your covering at that time. He didn't want to do it because he didn't want to. When, when he thought he was going to get Naomi's land, he's like, yeah, I'll do that. Then he's like, you got to raise up seed to Naomi, though. And then when Naomi has seed, because women weren't allowed to possess land, to be the deed holders of land, when that's why Ruth and Boaz gave their firstborn child to who? Um, Naomi. Because he had to deed the right to that land after, after the year of Jubilee when the land would have returned to Naomi. Okay? So... Land deeds, covenant, covering, all of that stuff is all tied in this, and you have to know the Torah. The whole point about all of this is you have to know the Torah to understand what is going on. Because the Torah defines all of those rules and all those lines. That's my message for today. Awesome. Uh, the the countings, the Torah portion is Exodus 38, 21 through 40, 38. The hot door is 1 Kings 7, 51, 8 through 21. And the gospel is Luke 16, 1 through 13. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.